Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Well, it's great to be back with you again. And uh, it's been a little while since uh, I've been up here in Arvada, maybe a month or so, and I really love what you're doing with the place. I don't know if you're where I am at. Usually every year I take on some big home project, whether it's landscaping or something inside the house. And you know, you got all this excitement and energy and you look everything up on YouTube and you figure out you're, exact, you're an expert, you know exactly what to do. And every project, there's that one point that you reach where you think, am I crazy? You know, what, what happened? And, and uh, I don't know, hopefully you won't get there here, but uh, it's awesome. It's been a great service, great service. Um, Today, I uh, am super excited for a lot of reasons, mainly because I, I know many of you, and it's great to be with you, be able to have this time with you. I'm also very excited that this is the first time that one of my grandchildren has actually been here to hear me preach. And so little Lincoln is right there. And uh, not that I'm that nervous about it, since I'm pretty sure he won't remember a single thing about today. But the one thing I will do is Hans has characterized me as more of a boisterous preacher. I think that's a nice way of saying I talk really loud. But with little Lincoln right here, I'm going to try to stay a little bit more calm today, okay? So you might see a little bit different style. Anyways, today we're going to have more of a family talk, okay? I'm going to put on a little bit of the elder's role today, elder's hat. And I'd like to have a family talk about a subject that I think is very, very important for everyone in this congregation. It doesn't really matter what your circumstances or your position in life is right now, your status in life is right now. At some point, either it's going to involve you personally or someone is going to come to you for advice. And at that time, I hope that today will be of some help to you, okay? Today's message is going to be on finding our soulmate. Finding our soulmate. Any any singles kind of excited about that, uh, that theme right there? Finding our soulmate, okay? God's amazing plan for men and women. Now, I have heard that There are many people who say there's no such thing as a soulmate. I don't want to get into that argument. What I mean is finding the one. All right, you know what I'm talking about? Finding the one. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Now, society has a lot to say about this topic of finding the one, don't they? There's a lot of advice. You know, there's advice at at the checkout counter at your local Safeway. You know, at your King Super, when you look at those magazine racks, and there's a whole bunch of articles about what it means to find the one. How do you know he's the one? How do you know she's the one? Ten signs, eight signs, to let you know that she's the one or he's the one, all right? I'm not sure that the checkout line at the grocery store is probably the place to get the advice for this, but nonetheless, there is a lot of advice that is being provided there, okay? There's also a lot of advice that you can hear from movies, you know, or songs, I remember Eric and I watched this one movie a long time ago called The Lake House or something like that. And some guy got, bought this house and he was remodeling it and he wrote a letter and stuck it in, or, no, he found a letter in his mailbox and it was from someone else at a different time who had lived in that same house. And the whole movie is about them writing letters back and forth, you know, from one time zone to another time zone. I'm not talking about like Pacific and Standard and that kind of thing. I'm talking about different years and trying to figure out how they could meet. It was a very entertaining movie, but I'm not sure that sticking letters in the mailbox in front of your house to someone you've never met is the way to find the one, is it? You know, I think about songs. Uh, I had never heard of of Adele until I went on a business trip, and Mimi, who's my music coordinator, basically uploaded a whole couple of albums of Adele into my iPad. And so it's my practice, I'm debt lagged, I'm somewhere in, in a hotel, and I'm tired, and I want to go to sleep, and I'll just put in my earphones, and I'll listen to music, and that night I plugged on, you know, I pressed on the playlist for Adele. And I got to tell you, the worst job in the whole world is to be Adele's former boyfriend. <laughs> because it's like, that was a lot of material on that subject. It was very consistent. She doesn't like him anymore, okay? Okay. And uh, so, and then, of course, you can always go to your local high school, okay, and check out what's going on in the hallways and get some input from these very experienced people, (laughs) all right, who have so much background and education to draw upon to help you find the one. Or you can, I found this, you can go online and Google it, and there are websites, like I said, on 10 Steps to Finding Your Soulmate, 4 Steps to Finding Your Soulmate. 10 Steps seem quite a bit, 4 Steps seems a little bit light. So I went with the six-step website. 
And uh, when I went there, it was very entertaining. It was the Guy Am Life website. And we all at Guy Am Life. That's where you go for the best insight into, the, into life in this world. And uh, they had some really cool steps that I thought were worthy of note. Things like follow your dreams. The example that she gave was some guy had a dream with a cell phone number in it. Got up and texted. First of all, I couldn't do that because I forget my dreams as soon as I get up. But this guy remembered the cell phone, texted. They answered. They started texting back and forth, fell in love, and they got married. So if you dream a text, a phone number in your dreams, write it down, okay? And then it says, follow your intuition. One lady woke up one morning, and she said, I've got to go to the aquarium. She never wanted to go to the aquarium before, but she had to go to the aquarium. And you know what? She went to the aquarium, and she met the dolphin trainer, and they fell in love, and now they live in Hawaii, which is proof, which is proof that you've got to follow your intuition. Amen? Okay, so we can end today. I, I gave you all I got, okay? No. So, so how can we know what to do? All right? How can we know where to go? How can we know what the process is? How can we know who's the one? Well, we're all Christians, so maybe we should ask what God says. All right, what does God say about this? Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 have an excellent sort of, you know, espresso size statement about these kind of decisions in our lives. And it says right here, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, Oh, today I wanted to warn you. I'm actually not going to put scriptures on the screen. You have to actually look them up in your Bible. Okay? So, you know, I'm sorry in advance for the extra work that this is going to cause. But yeah, find these scriptures in your Bible. To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his perfect, pleasing, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Well, what an awesome process that God gives us. He says, first of all, what you need to do is you need to make sure that you've given your life to God. Is this, it's a living sacrifice. It's not a one-time deal. Every single day, you need to make sure that your life is one that's committed and devoted to your relationship with God. To the love that you have for him. And then he says, don't conform to the pattern of this world. Listen, in any area, whether it's career, dating, family, parenting, friendships, ethics and moral values at work. In all of these areas, the world has a lot to say. But the Bible says, don't be conformed to that. It doesn't mean that we don't listen, that we don't learn, that we're not humble. But it means that we don't allow ourselves to be conformed to the thinking of this world. He says, instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind through what? Through your relationship with God. To where you're actually taking on Christ's thoughts, Christ's value system, Christ's priorities. He doesn't say follow a bunch of rules. Do you understand what I'm saying? What we do in this church is not about following rules. It's about being transformed from within. And when we get the heart of Christ, what is important to him, what he values, what he finds joy in, then it equips us to make the right choices for our life. He says, it's at that time, then you will know what is good, pleasing, and perfect will is. Then you're going to know God's plan for you. And you know what he says? It's an awesome plan. It's a pleasing plan. It's a great plan. That's where God is at. Today, I especially wanted to say, Eric and I were talking about this lesson, that I'm talking to a lot of our teens today. So if you're a teen today, this lesson is in many ways for you. It's a follow-up from last week's talk about family. But I'm talking to college students as well, singles, but also marrieds and people who are raising kids. Why? Because there are many of us who became Christians after we were married. And what happens is, when you're raising your own kids... You know, it's kind of like a firefight sometimes. And in the heat of battle, what do you do? You default to whatever is natural. You kind of default to what you know. But maybe what you know is not 
the result of being transformed by Christ, but as a result of living conformed to this world. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay. Sometimes people will come to us for advice. And we don't really have that experience of, of dating, of being a single or a teenager in Christ. And if we don't have that experience, sometimes all we have is what the world tells us. And so that's why today I wanted to encourage all of us to pay attention. Amen? Okay? And especially parents, I want to ask you to give me your full attention and think about this. And I also want to create, present a disclaimer, okay? Today is not a theological position paper on the part of the Denver Church of Christ. It's not the result of extensive decades of PhD research by a social scientist. Today is just a result of reading the Bible a lot, spending decades working with teenagers, campus, and singles. It's the result of being in Christ 36 years, married 31 years, raising our kids. Today is meant to be a conversation starter. I hope that the best thing that could happen today is we go home and we talk about it. And we think about it. We come up with our own convictions about what God has to say about these things. So the first thing that I want to talk about today, it sounds a little new agey, but that God created dimensions of the human experience. Okay? No, I did not find this on the Gaim Life website. Okay? God created dimensions of the human experience. What does this mean? Well, let's go to Mark chapter 12. I hope this scripture is well read in your Bible. In Mark chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus is saying this is the most important command. And you know what he's doing? He's describing our relationship with God. And when he describes our relationship with God, God's will, his will, the perfect relationship, what does he say? He says, listen, that relationship is going to engage your heart. It's going to engage your soul. It's going to engage your mind. It's going to engage your strength. In other words, your relationship with God, my relationship with God, it's about something physical, how we live every day. It's emotional, how we feel about God. It's intellectual, our convictions, our thoughts, our priorities. It's spiritual. It's eternal. When we read the Bible, the things that are eternal are God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, His Word, the angels in our souls. It's eternal. This is how God made us, and He made us this way because this is the kind of way that He looks at relationships. He said a true, complete, fulfilled relationship is going to engage you on all of these dimensions. Now you go on and you see that in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, the Bible says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, your soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see what I'm saying? He's saying there's different dimensions of our life, and he wants all of them to be engaged with God. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Let's look in an old... Oldie but goodie. Oldie but goodie. In chapter 4, verse 12 of Hebrews, it says, For the word of God is alive and active, living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing what? Soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of what? The heart. Man, you've got soul and spirit, a spiritual dimension. You've got joints and marrow. Physical, fleshly dimension. You've got judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Our thoughts, our emotions. The heart. You see, as, as human beings, God created us to exist on several dimensions so that we could enjoy and experience our love for him and our love for each other to the fullest extent possible. And that's what sets us apart. We're going to read a little bit about creation, but let's talk about that. What sets us apart from this beautiful creation that God created that surrounds us? When I think about what's physical, the flesh, we could talk about a lot of things. Do cabbages have a physical existence? Are you the same as a cabbage or a lichen? I don't think so. Because cabbages don't have 
emotions. They don't have thoughts. They don't have a heart. But what about your dog? Is he physical? Is she physical? Does she have a heart? Emotions? Thoughts? Ours do. We got this one dog. He's Maltese. He's 13, and he is neurotic. I mean, it's funny. Like, we joke about him all the time. Something's a little bit off about him, but that's why we love him, okay? And, you know, um, he gets jealous. He's jealous of Lincoln already. You know, the first day Lincoln came to the house, we're all around Lincoln. He proceeds to go in the other room and poop on the carpet. I mean, you know, it's like, you go, what's going on? Well, there was more at work than just the physical act of needing to go to the bathroom because he knows how to do that outside. There was some emotion going on, okay? There was some jealousy, some attitude going on. Eric and I had this ability to go to South Africa last year. We went on safari. Probably one of the greatest experiences in our lives in terms of a physical trip. And uh, it was on our bucket list, and we went to uh, Kruger National Park. It was a private reserve right off of Kruger National Park. And we spent an entire week, every morning, every night, going on a safari drives. We got to observe wild animals, like from here to that structure right there. Lions, okay? Cheetahs, leopards, with their young, hyenas, killing, eating. And you know, you get to understand, there's a whole society out there in the jungle, okay? They are about, they loyal to their pride. They're about self-preservation, survival. They'll sacrifice for their young. They'll fight together as a family. There is a culture and a society out there. But you know what? It's not like us. The imagination, the creativity, the ability to innovate and to dream. That does, they don't have that. We were amazed, we were impressed. In fact, I will tell you, when we thought about we thought about the mafia. That's like a lion society. The strongest survive, you kill. But that's not truly what God called us to be. God gave us something greater. He gave us the spirit. He gave us the eternal soul. He helped us understand, it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, that he put eternity in the hearts of men. That there's so much more than just what we see. We are unique. We are special to God. We're extraordinary. God created us on these dimensions. And if we're going to find the one, if we're going to experience fulfillment and satisfaction and joy at its richest level, God says, I want you to experience it on all of these dimensions. That's who God created us to be. So when we walk with God, we connect with him spiritually. We engage our intellect, our feelings, our emotions, our passions with him. We reflect our love for him by the way that we live like Jesus every single day in this body, in this flesh. Do you see what I'm saying? God created us to exist in these dimensions. Well... God also created a plan for men and women. Let's go to Genesis. I'm hearing some pages. Wow, paper Bibles. Yes. Okay, Genesis chapter 1. Throughout Genesis chapter 1, we read about the account of the creation. Physical life has been created. The cabbages, the lions, okay, the plants, the animals, they've all been created. But he gets to the end, and what is the height, the ultimate pinnacle of all creation? We just talked about that. In verse 27, it says, So God created mankind in his own image, and the image of God he created them. Male and female, he created them. Wow, the very pinnacle of creation. After everything else is done, that was just setting the stage, setting the table. But what is the main course? What's the high point? It's us. Mankind. And he says we've been created in his image. That's incredible. Now I want you to think right now, what is the most stunning scene that you've ever seen? You know, is it the Grand Canyon? I know for Eric and I, every time we drive I-70, and there's that little rise coming through Evergreen. Where you go under that overpass, you come out, and then there's the Continental Divide. From the first time we moved here, And we went up to the mountains to pray. Every single time we drive, we stop talking right there and just look. It's stunning. I don't care, though, if it's a sunset, if it's a volcano exploding, if it's the top of Mount Fuji, if it's the ocean at sunset or sunrise. 
all of that is nothing compared to you. You know, actually, when we look at each other in the fellowship, we should look at each other and go, man, I'm in awe of you. You're incredible, Garrett. You know, you're amazing, Naomi. I see God's power glorified in you. We're the pinnacle of everything that God intended for this world. And he gave us something special. He gave us his nature. We're created in his image. We're created with a spirit in us. And then God created us as man and woman. He created us as man and woman in a relationship with him. It's pretty incredible. There was no afterthought. There's no mistake. There's no oversight. He said, in perfection, there needs to be a man and there needs to be a woman. In chapter 2, let's go to verse 18. This is that kind of funny, I like that whole story, where God says, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And you know, they go through that process of interviewing the lions. Can you cook? No. All right, you're out. You know, uh, you know that kind of a thing. And uh, God creates a woman. Now, I'm not exactly sure why God wrote the story like this, but here's what I do know. Imperfection, because there was no sin yet in the world. Imperfection. God said there needs to be a man and a woman. And at that point, oh, I'm talking too loud for Lincoln. God had a relationship with Adam, and he created, even had a relationship with her, and then they came together. Now, he says, I will create a helper suitable for him. I just want to take a second to explain this, because a lot of times people misunderstand what it means. The word for helper is not some subservient slave. Actually, the word for helper here is used, I don't know, like 50, 60 times. Glenn would know exactly off the top of his head. Throughout the Old Testament, most of the time it's used about God. It's about strength. It's about being someone who can save. Most of the time, like I said, it's about how God is that for us. Strength. He has the ability to save us. The word suitable. Interestingly, it can mean in opposition to, which can describe a marriage from time to time. But what it actually means is more like a contrast. Like when you look at yourself in the mirror, it's your mirror image. Isn't that cool? And God is saying, you know, physically, we're mirror images of each other. We're not the same, but we're exactly mirror images. We complement each other. That can also happen emotionally and spiritually. So I want all of us to understand, especially because of what we hear in society. God never teaches that either one of these roles is subservient, that either one of these roles is inferior, that either one of these roles has any sort of uh, a deficit. But God teaches from the beginning that these roles, men and women, they're equal partners in fulfilling his plan and his purpose. Society can try to tell us that Christianity and the Bible teach a different lesson. But we can't be conformed by the world. We've got to be transformed by God's truth. Amen? And as God's people, we recognize and we acknowledge and we celebrate our differences. But at the same time, we confirm and we affirm we are equal in God's sight. Amen? We all have value and we all have importance. So now we go to chapter 2, verse 23. And what does he say? He says, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and a mother, a father and mother, and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So let me make sure that we get this. Man is in relation with God, woman is in relation with God, and now they're in relation with each other, and they are completely united. And the Bible says they became one flesh. Now, when it says one flesh, there's obviously obviously a sexual implication, okay? But when you think about the whole context, there's also a heart, soul, and mind implication. Do you remember how God expects us to relate to him? 
What did he say was involved? Our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. And if Adam and Eve were related to him in perfection, what's the context of the relationship? Surely it was heart, soul, mind, and strength. I think about this reference to leaving your father and mother. What do we get from our fathers and mothers, ideally? Nurturing. What else? Security. Love. I'm sorry? We get some discipline? Yes. Okay. Self-awareness. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. We get safety. We're able to be vulnerable with our parents. They protect us. And all of a sudden, the Bible says, you know what? You leave your father and mother, and now you get all of those things from your spouse. You get it from each other. It's not just a physical unity, but it's a unity that's based on several dimensions, all the dimensions that God created us to have. And then the Bible says they were naked and they felt no shame. That's an amazing scripture. They were completely known and they were completely secure. They were completely open and they felt completely safe. That's an incredible relationship. Total vulnerability, total transparency, and total security and confidence and strength. This was God's plan for man and for woman. Does that sound like a soulmate to you? Sounds pretty awesome to me, actually. Now, we all know the unfortunate thing is in Genesis chapter 3, sin enters the world. We live in a fallen world today. And in our fallen world, sin has perverted so much of what God intended us to have as a blessing. And I got to tell you, I think probably in no, more, no area, okay, more than the relationship between men and women has Satan perverted God's original blessed plan. He's distorted it. He's perverted it. He's created darkened thinking and ignorance and hardened hearts. And because of that, when we look around ourselves, we see incredible pain, incredible destruction. I mean, every day in the news you read about the kind of suffering, the kind of trauma, the kind of horrible consequences of Satan being able to get in there and pervert God's original amazing plan for men and women. But the good news is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, if anybody's in Christ, what is he? A new creation. What about the old? It's gone. What about the new? It's come. It's here, right? You see, if we live according to Christ and become truly new creations, the Bible says we can redeem his plan. We can get his plan back the way it was originally intended to be. And as Christians, we can enjoy the fullness of the blessing. And you know, that's not just for marriage. Oh, I didn't hit that. In Psalm 68, The Bible says that God puts the lonely in families. That is a part of God's plan for men and women, that we would become each other's families. I love this in Mark chapter 10, verse 30. It says, a hundred times as much. If you lose things in this life, you will receive a hundred times as much. What? Brothers, sisters, mothers, children. He doesn't put fathers, which hurt my feeling originally. But then I think, you know, you you can only put up with so many fathers in your life. Not maybe, maybe more than one, but not hundreds, okay? Anyways, he says, hun- you know, fathers, he just, you get, you get a, f- a family. He goes on, he says, in 1 Timothy 5, 1 through 2, you know, here's how we're supposed to treat each other. He said, if, treat your older men like fathers. Treat younger men like brothers. Older women like mothers. Younger women like sisters with absolute purity. So this lesson right now, God's plan for men and women, it's not just for those of you who are married. Or even those of you who hope to get married someday. It's for all of us. That that God has this amazing way of using each one of us and who we are as men and women to be able to fulfill this incredible plan of experience fulfillment emotionally, spiritually, physically. Now, let's go on and let's try to kind of boil this down a little bit. This is a little pyramid. It's actually nowhere in the Bible except maybe during Pharaoh's time. Did they build pyramids? I don't know. It's just a diagram. It's not doctrinal, okay? So please don't fall away over this diagram right here. It's just my way of trying to visualize what I see God's plan for us being.
being, okay? He says, listen, you have spirit. When you think about a relationship, a godly relationship, finding your soulmate, finding the one, the place you need to start is with the most important priority, the dimension of your life that has to do with the spirit, that has to do with your faith. You remember Romans chapter 12 said, you can't know God's will until you're fully committed to him as a living sacrifice. In Genesis chapter 2, before man and woman came, God and man. First comes God, then everything else. So the key to all relationships, and especially finding the right one, is how is my relationship with God? Now we all know, biblically, we won't have time to go into this, that to know the head, Christ, who do we also have to know? The body. He says, you know, you can't have an ear sticking out of the head. You can't have a foot sticking out of the head. They all belong to the body. And when they're all together, they're connected with the head, Christ himself. We need the body. So when we talk about building a foundation for our, fa- for our relationships that's based on the spirit, it definitely has to do with belonging to the body of Christ. Amen? Okay. So let's think about that. What are your favorite one another passages in the Bible? Give me a couple of them. I'm sure you have some. Love one another. Okay, that kind of covers everything. What else? What's that? Sharpen one another. Yes, that ability to be humble, to get involved in each other's lives, to create self-awareness, and to grow together. Huge part of being a part of God's body. Anything else? One another. Carry one another's another's burdens. That's right. Praying for each other. I've been praying for the Klauses this week. You know, carrying each other's burdens. Because you, you sincerely put that person above yourself. What else? Encourage. Encourage one another. Okay. How often? Daily. As long as it's called today. You know, putting courage into people. Helping them to feel like they can do stuff that they didn't think they could do. Or they were too scared to do. There's so many different scriptures. All of this is a part of finding the one. Do you realize that? How do you start with finding the one? Encouraging one another in here. Carrying each other's burdens in here. Loving one another in here. Serving one another in here. That's how you find the one. Now he goes on. we, we, we on. We talked about the heart, the intellect, the emotion. Here's the amazing thing. When you get this part right, you create safety and security and openness. Now you can actually get to know each other at the heart level. Because you're not so caught up and worried about superficiality. When you hear about someone's weakness, you don't judge them. You pray for them. You grow with them. You work together. See, when you build the right foundation, you actually have created this atmosphere and this security where you can actually know someone deeply and it's safe to know each other deeply. Do you remember when they said they knew no shame? Okay, So at this level, men and women can become truly brothers and sisters. Know each other's aspirations and dreams. Not worry about impressing each other. But know what really makes each other tick. This is an amazingly powerful stage in the process of finding the one that the world often doesn't have. Because they haven't created the foundation of security and safety. How can you truly find the one if you don't have the ability to know who they really are? But that's what the foundation does. You know, I think about me and Erica. I was sharing last week in the sermon. I became a Christian and I went on my first Christian date like a couple weeks later. And uh, I forgot if she asked me or I was told by a brother that I should go on an encouragement date. And like I said, it was kind of a great experience. I mean, we had this really in-depth conversation. We talked about our back, past, uh, past backgrounds and about what we wanted to do with our lives, about our relationship with God. And we laughed and she laughed at all of my jokes. It was incredible. Wrote, wrote me a card, you know. And, and like I said, I was so convinced, oh, I think she loves me. And then I realized every single sister I went out with was just like that. And it created this amazing encouragement. I love going out on Christian dates. But what happened was we, I went out on a date with Erica and we sat on the front porch, you know, and there's a barbecue. There's five, of, five girls and five guys. And we're sitting there talking. And we had never actually, we served in the teens together volunteering, but we never actually talked deeply. And we just sat there. And it was like our whole lives came out. 
And you know, when that night ended, it didn't end with a kiss. It didn't end with sex. It ended with a hug. And I went home and I said, wow, I really like her. She said the same thing, apparently. And, uh, and you know, we ended up connecting. But there were other sisters that I thought maybe I really, really liked. The great thing is, is that Eric and I were able to get married without leaving a whole bunch of damage in our wake. I think about, you know, Miyoko's here with Jason today. I hope she doesn't mind me sharing, but Jason wasn't her first boyfriend in the church. She had a couple of boyfriends in the church. In fact, there was one that she thought maybe he's the one. They dated for several years. You know, Miyoko got married when she was 27, I believe. She had a couple boyfriends in the church. And on that wedding day, she walked down the aisle. They had their vows. And when they turned to each other and Jason kissed, that was the first time she'd ever kissed a man in her life other than me. It's not impossible. It's the plan of God. And they have a phenomenal marriage. And it's the same thing with my other daughter, Manami. She had a couple of boyfriends in the church. But when she realized they weren't the right ones, they were able to break up and move on. And there was no regret. There was no shame. Because they had built this pyramid, this this structure of a relationship the way God intended it to be. You see, you don't have to test drive to find the right one. What you have to do is build a relationship God's way. And it's after all of that that the Bible says, I have this beautiful, God says, I have this beautiful blessing in store for you and it's called the physical intimacy between a man and a wife. And I want to tell you, God says this, it's amazing. In fact, he wrote a whole book about it. He refers to it several times throughout the Bible. God's not shy about sex. He's really, really adamant that it's an incredible gift if we view it through his lenses. That the two become one flesh. I remember when, after we'd been married, Erica told me once, she said, you know, our physical relationship is so special. And she opened my eyes to understand her perspective. She said, because you are a minister. So you have to be nice to everyone. You know, they come through the door, you got to be nice to them, you know? you gotta, you got to get up and serve them, and you got to go over in the middle of the night and take care of them, and, and you got to really, you know, love everyone. But of all the people in this world, this is something only you and I have. That's better than a ring. That's amazing. It opened my eyes. That is God's plan. That, you know, we love everybody in the church. We treat brothers and sisters with purity and get to know them as close friends. But then there's that one. The only one. The soulmate. And you get to experience that amazing, amazing gift. And you know, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says that the storms of life are going to beat against our marriages, our house, our family, our relationships. But you know, when it's built strong, they just bounce off. It doesn't, it shakes us. It weakens us sometimes, but we can stand. And if you read Proverbs chapter five, turn here because it's a really great passage. How you guys doing? You with me? Okay, hopefully you're getting excited. All right, chapter five. It says in verse uh, verse, uh, 18, may your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer, May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. I just want you to think about this. What did he just say? He says, blessed. What does blessed mean? Superlatively happy. Full of rejoicing. Fully satisfied. I love this one. Intoxicated. We live in Colorado. He says, your relationship should intoxicate you. May you be satisfied with, I mean, intoxicated by her love. Can I ask you a question? If you found the one, if you found a person, a woman or a man, 
And with that person, you found blessedness, rejoicing, satisfaction. If you felt every day, I'm intoxicated by your love. Do you think that would be a soulmate? See, God has a plan. We just got to follow it. Now, here's the tricky thing, guys. The process that I just described to you is for the most part one way. Now, I know you might doubt me, but there's a lot of one-way things in life. All right? Most rivers in this world are one way, right? There's like five in the whole world that are two ways, okay? Almost always one way. I think about, I think about things that are one way. I, I, can you think of something that you do that has to be done in a certain order? Like how about, how about surgery? Would you like your surgeon to come in and cut you and then apply the anesthesia later? I don't think so, okay? How about those of you who are baking? What if we decide to put the eggs in the oven, the milk in the oven, the flour in the oven, then we baked it, and then we tried to mix it up? I don't think that works. How about those of you who fly a lot? How would you like the pilot to land the plane and then extend the landing gear? No, there is, a, there is an order to most things in this life. I think about this project right here. You know, what if you're building a house and you built the whole house, you go, oh, I forgot the foundation. You can't do that, right? There's an order to things. Well, there is an order to the way that God wants us to build our relationships. Go to Genesis chapter 3. The tricky thing about this order is the world doesn't buy it. The world doesn't buy what I just described. Why? Well, because Satan is in the world. And look at Satan's line of reasoning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree, fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will certainly die. Or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here's the way the world thinks because of Satan. He says, starts out and says, did God really say you can't eat from any? God never said that. And so, you know, the world says stuff like, did God, is God against love? Is God against romance? Is God against my personal happiness? The Bible doesn't say that. But that's the way the world twists it to seem. Right? He says, well, you're not going to die. You'll be okay. Don't worry about God's holiness. Nothing bad will happen to you. If it feels good, do it. If everybody else is doing it, you'll be just fine. If it's in Us Magazine or People Magazine, it should be okay. And then he lies about God's heart. He says he doesn't want you to be like him. God's holding out on you. I will tell you, this one, I'm talking to teens, the campus students, that you, you feel like you're missing out on something that everybody else gets in on and that God's holding out on you. That is absolutely a lie of Satan and it's a lie of this world. You see, God knows because he created us that there's a process to getting to the ultimate happiness. That there's a process to getting to that soulmate, to the one. There's a process to the kind of love that God wants to give us. And he's saying, don't settle for the cheap version. He's not holding out. He's protecting. But that's what the world does. And if you look in Isaiah, we won't go there, but he says the world is an expert for turning light for dark and dark for light. Bitter for sweet. Twisting things around. That's what the world does. And the world takes that relationship that we talked about and turns it upside down. So where does the world start? Well, is anybody surprised that the world starts with the flesh? With what's physical? Isn't physical attraction everything for many, many people? You know, when you, read a, you see a movie about falling in love, how often it is that you just catch someone's eye. Some of the songs that I actually like the melodies to. 
about, I saw you in the store. Will you marry me? I'm like, how did we get there? <laughs> what, how did that, what, what, what happened in that process? You know, what's going on in marketing and advertising? Okay, what do people talk about in school? And you know what God says? He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed in the reunion of your mind. Now I will tell you, when the physical, when the flesh is detached from the spirit and the heart, what happens? Perversion. I know that's a strong word, but it's absolutely what, I wish I had a stronger word. Degradation. Destruction. Ruin. When you take this out of God's plan and you make that the beginning of your relationship, it's a complete distortion. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about sexting. Where's the heart? Where's the spirit? Where's the transparency of getting to know each other deeply, fully, intellectually, emotionally? Where's the dedication, the character? No, it's just a picture. What about pornography? When you're engaged in pornography, where's the spirit? Where's the godly commitment to forever? Where's the love, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness? Where is it? I was reading Time Magazine. They had an article. It said, in 2005, there were about 58 million visitors per month to porn sites. Is that amazing? That's nothing. In 2015, on one site, there are 2.8 million visitors per hour. In 2015, from that one site, people watch 4.4 trillion hours of pornography in one year. Right now, in our country, the age... Where you're av- the average age where you're first exposed to pornography is 12. And it rewires your brain. This article was basically focused on the fact that there are now an epidemic among young men in their 20s and 30s who cannot have normal sex because they've been rendered impotent by their overexposure to pornography. What does that do to your marriage? What does that do to your relationships? What does that do to your self-esteem? What does that do to God's plan? You must use the word. It perverts it. It distorts it. It destroys it. There's no other way of describing it. Someone told me about this. This is a video of a guy named Ted Bundy. One of the most notorial, notorious serial killers ever in American history. Rapist killer. This is his interview hours before he dies with James Dobson, who's a Christian writer about family. I hope you can hear it. It's a little bit, the sound's not as loud. It's a little bit long, but please watch it through. You'll remember this video. Is that chilling? Those words are very haunting to me. He says, pornography can reach out and grab a child from your home. He says, your sons, your husbands, they're within its grasp. I'm saying this to this audience because I know that there are some fathers in here, maybe some mothers, who struggle with this. Think of your children. Love them enough to say no. And when we're talking to our kids, 
It's not about just taking away a cell phone or a computer or something like that, although those things must be done from time to time. But it's about helping the heart to understand why. Why we say no. Because there's something so much better that God has in store for us. And for those of us who are young, you're right now making these decisions for the rest of your life. What will it do to your brain? What will it do to your body? How will it affect your future relationship? These are decisions that we're making now that can't be undone because, like we said, it's one way. The physicality is one way in relationships. I know that every day, our young, men and, our young women in our church are pressured at school about getting involved, getting rid of their virginity, Kissing, making out, having sex. You know, the problem is, is that process is one way. I've been around a long time now and counseled a lot of people. And I will tell you in almost every single case, once you hit that first step of physicality, the relationship stops there. It doesn't become about your aspirations, your dreams. It doesn't come about growing together as character. It doesn't become about what vision does God have for us in life? What impact can we make on others? How can we serve? How can we grow? It's about when can we get together and do this again? And it becomes pressure and pressure. And it becomes disillusionment. And in so many cases, the relationship ends there and you've given up that one thing. That one thing. Who cares about the ring? The one thing you could have given. The most precious gift you could have provided to the person you love more than anyone else in the world. Because it's one way. Now, I don't want people to get discouraged. I understand there's God's grace. And praise God for that. That grace washed Eric and I on our wedding day. But that's not the way God intends it to be. You know, I remember reading about an interview of a a man who was known for his romantic leading roles in movies. And the interviewer said very innocently, hey, tell me, what do you think makes a great lover? And the guy's answer, I love it. He said, you know what? The definition of being a great lover is not, you know, going around and being able to sleep as many women as you want. He said, any dog can do that. He said, the definition of being a great lover is being able to fully love and fully satisfy one woman all the days of her life. That's a great lover. You know, we've just been through this whole talk today. We're not cabbages, and hopefully we're not dogs. God's created us to be something so much better than that, hasn't he? And he's created this amazing existence for us but it's one way. We've got to follow God's plan. You know, this is Miyoko, I mean, uh, Manami and Ross. And they were married when they were 25. They were able to give each other the greatest gift. That's something very special. It's something that will bond them together for the rest of their lives. You know, sometimes we say, well, I'm not doing this part. I'm just involved in the heart. I'm obsessed with this person. And that's what a lot of the movies and the media portray, right? Well, I'm sorry. But my experience has also shown me that when it comes about one person, then you've missed out on the character development of being loving to everyone, of being respectful to everyone, of serving everyone. I'll tell you, if you have someone in your life who just does all those things only for you, don't feel special, feel scared. Because someday, it won't be you anymore. Okay? Okay? It's a weak foundation, and it'll crumble. And what happens is, the storms of life come, they beat against that house, and it falls. It gets destroyed. And in this society, we don't have, this is not an allegory, this is a fact in the culture in which we live right now. Isn't that right? So, God has a better way. And his way is to follow his process. So let's just close out now by talking about the Denver Church of Christ teen ministry culture.
And I'm not just talking to the teens because they already know most of this. I'm talking to the parents who don't know most of this. All right? What is our culture? What have we tried to build here in the Denver Church of Christ teen ministry on dating? First of all, we believe that you've got to start with the Spirit of God. That before you get involved in all sorts of dating and steady dating and girlfriend, boyfriend stuff, you've got to be a strong Christian. Get your relationship with God down right. Because we, our goal for our teenagers is not baptism. Baptism is not the goal of the Denver Church of Christ. The goal of the Denver Church of Christ is a lifelong walk with God. A relationship with God. Where you're developing faith and convictions and humility and character. All the things we talked about. Plus the relationship with the other brothers and sisters in the ministry. Not a tunnel vision focus on things. But saying, I will love all the brothers, all the sisters. I'm going to get input into my life. We're going to grow together. That's where it starts. And that's why we don't date just any kid from school. Anybody who just we like. We're first involved in the fellowship here. Building that foundation. Oh, I'm sorry. How do you reverse this? And then the next part is the heart. Now, I don't know if you all are aware of this, but we practice encouragement dating. It's a very technical term that means you date to encourage. (laughs) Did you get that, Mark? Dr. Pride got that, okay. So what you do is you actually go out on dates to encourage one another. Not necessarily fall in love. Not to be romantic. Not to be like, you know, in the movies. But to encourage that person. Your whole focus is to go out on that date and help that person leave that date going, I feel better. I feel good. I feel built up. I feel encouraged. All of our boys and girls are encouraged, men and women, sorry, young men and women, are encouraged to go out on encouragement dates, okay? We have all sorts of activities for this. We also encourage just friendships. All of our daughters have this incredible blessing of having so many best friends who are boys. Because there are pure relationships in the church, there was so much trust, and there wasn't weirdness. And they could talk, and they could have fun together, they could share, they could be there for each other, and they were truly brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? This purity is so incredibly important. And in the church, we talk about men being gentlemen and women being ladies. I know that might seem from the past, but I think it's sort of an ageless practice. And I'm so proud of so many of our young men. They have these encouragement nights for the girls, encouragement nights for the boys. It's really, really an awesome culture, okay? And that's the beauty of God's plan. Now, I will tell you that every now and then, there will be a a sister and a brother in the teen ministry who are going to fall in love. Awesome. If it doesn't happen, awesome. You're young. Eric and I told our kids, the chances are 99% you will not marry your first boyfriend. Because that's just the way it is. So don't stress over it. Don't stress over getting one, and don't stress over keeping one. Because you know the great thing in the, in, in the church, and the way we date, is that if it's not the right one, you move on, and there's no regret. There's no shame. It was fun. It was a great experience. And if it goes the right way, you've built it on the right foundation. Amen? And so, romance maybe, but maybe not. But that's not the point. We're building the foundation the way God intended it to be built. And so, let's close by reading this psalm. Psalm 37, 3 and 4. This is written inside of me and Erica's wedding rings. And it's this. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of of your heart. God has an amazing plan for each one of us. But what it's going to take on our part is faith to follow him. So may you enjoy in your life blessedness, joy, satisfaction, intoxication, and complete and utter love. Thank you very much.